and Greg, here's here's the thing. My daughters are growing up in the 2020s. They're growing up in an environment in which if there's any racism, it is so infinitesimal that it doesn't merit slightest discussion. And I get the feeling, it's going to be interesting when they look back on this in 15 years, but I get the feeling that they might grow up not thinking of themselves precisely as black. They might think of it as an intellectual concept, but I think they think of themselves as mutts, especially because with their generation and in my neighborhood, mutts are the default. White people are rare. Blonde hair is rare. They, they don't rule except, you know, economically. But they live in a new America. Now, I know that for a great many people, including very kind and sensitive people, the idea that they would grow up thinking that way is revolting, utterly nauseating. There would be, you know, white people who listen to NPR. There are listening to me saying this and shaking their heads and thinking, this is where I lose McWhorter. You know, how dare they not think of themselves as black? You're saying that they... that. At best, they'd be a little hasty if in 10 years, a black girl comes up to them and says, do you think you're black? And they say, well, frankly, no, I'm just me. And we've all known black people like that who were a little previous. And I'm sure that all three of us have thought of people like that. I knew a couple of them in college. It's too early. Yes, you are black. You know, what, what's wrong with you? And yes, everybody, even me, thought that way. So you're saying scaffolding, but how fast? Like, what about if one of my daughters, and I can tell which one of them it's going to be, is going to say in 2032, you know, I'm not black. What well, what I, what do we do? Uh, yeah, that is, is, is a, it's a tough conundrum. I, I admit it. It's a very tough conundrum. I would say that because of your work, John. See that that's why knowing someone's work is so important. At some point, your daughters are going to be intellectually able and curious enough to read Talking Black. Talking Back, Talking Black. To mm -hmm. me, your book is a profoundly uh, uh, superb defense of, again, Black American culture through language. We could say Afro-American. We could say Negro-American. I mean, we use these different terms. We've been battling over that for 150 years. And when they read that, they will realize that's a part of their heritage. Okay? So, as Black Americans, we are not just Black. Africa is a part of our heritage. Europe is a part of our heritage. It's a mixture. It's a composite. That's the thing. So, they are both culturally and biologically actual mixtures. Now, of course, I'm not talking about race transmitted through through blood, oh my God, that's really old school. But I'm saying that the mixtures are fine now. There are certain things that Glenn values in terms of like the Black American religious tradition. I grew up on my mother's side, it was Pentecostal, on my dad's side, it was African Methodist Episcopal. So I have both of those you know, tributaries in my own heritage. My daughter, Kaya, we took her to church, but we didn't take her to church religiously like I did. So she has the experience, but she doesn't have as much of an identification with that part of her heritage. That's gonna happen, but she still can appreciate it, you know? So, I mean, it's a question of what you expose them to, John. And I, you know, look, the music, you got those musical symbols in the back. You're not gonna just expose them to, I mean, if you expose them to the Broadway music that you love and then show them where in hip hop culture, they use aspects from the jazz tradition in terms of certain beats, certain lyrics, certain this and that, and you make the connection to them from, from, from Broadway and, and, the, and the American songbook to jazz, to hip hop. So in other words, you can help them make certain cultural connections. They're getting it. They're getting it, yeah. Uh, that right, part. right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. and what they're not getting is a narrative of victimization. That's what they're not getting. And that is or the print. problem that the aspect of so-called Black identity that is primarily or even exclusively focused on victimization and oppression as opposed to the part of the Black American tradition that's about resilience. That's about overcoming. That's about. Oh, hold on, Greg. I can't. I, I can't let you do this. I can't let you do this. I'm as much against victimization as anybody. Okay, 
the race narrative, I'm Black. I think of myself as Black. I identify as Black. And the victimization posture are completely distinct things. I can be worshiping Black excellence, Black achievement, Black heroes. I can have a narrative of Black uh, responsibility, of, of, of Black self-determination. Yes. That's not, that doesn't require me to think of myself as a victim. So that's a cheap shot. Okay. Now, it's very interesting that you say that. I appreciate you saying that because some of the people who look well, No, no. Wakanda. Wakanda forever. Ryan Coogler. Right. Uh, the whole cultural apparatus mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, name the TV shows, uh, name the playwrights, name the, the fiction writers, uh, Underground Railroad, name the uh, Tony Morris, uh, name the et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they mine the experience of Black people. They envision the future of Black people. To hang this uh, backward political posture, we're victims, or this reductive biological posture, race is an essence, around people who simply want to preserve and carry forward to the future a set of self-defining narratives built around the experience of their Black ancestors yeah. is to engage in a sleight of hand. Now, I want you to tell me why I should not teach my daughter or my son to adopt a kid, adopt homeless kids, kids who don't have parents, adopt, and then make sure they adopt Black kids because there are too many Black kids who go without parents. Why shouldn't we teach them when they are engaged in their tithing and their generosity and their gift giving to give to work on the ground in black communities, taking care of black ex-convicts, taking care of black people who need help? In other words, why the narrative of who I am in the world, just like the Jews, who wouldn't be the Jews if they had listened to people mouthing the kind of arguments that you are advancing now, get over it. Grow out of it. Don't cling to it. They are Jews today because their forefathers nurtured Jewishness. Why can't I nurture a cultural, not a biologically essential blackness, and buy the future for my people in a more positive way? That, that's what Clifton Roscoe is saying. He's not saying that um, Clifton Roscoe, by the way, is a correspondent at uh, glennlowry.substack who contributes pieces from time to time on race and is a very thoughtful uh, and well-informed individual. Um, he, he's not trying to embrace any kind of racial essentialism. He's just trying to be practical about how we move the ball forward. I hear you, and I appreciate the passion. I feel it. And, and I would say that and I'm going to lean on a, a philosophical concept by Kwame Anthony Appiah and Danielle Allen extends and elaborates that we can be rooted cosmopolitans. We could be rooted in, a, in traditions and in tradition, and we can be cosmopolitan at the same time. Look, the work that Robert Woodson does, that 10% of the proceeds of your very podcast goes to, that's why, and look, I don't have to say this because it probably is going to have people look at me askance, but I don't care. I signed that letter that was in support of Clarence Thomas against particularly white liberals who were calling him out of his name, racist names. I signed it, even though there were certain parts of the letter that I was like, eh, I don't really agree with this. Why? Because you and Robert Woodson asked me to. At first, when Charles Love did, and I respect Charles, don't get me wrong, he asked me, and I was like, mm, I don't know, man. Once Robert Woodson himself reached out, that was it, because I respect the work that he does in the community on the ground. And there are others. Reconstruction.us is an education organization. That is a- That's Roland Fryer. That's right. And Kaya Roland Fry. That's right. And Kaya, yeah, and Kaya So it's an educational project that's about focusing on our history and positive narratives. You have the Be Me community, Trey Beyond Shorters, that's talking about asset framing, identifying us in terms of our aspirations as opposed to a liability narrative. So you're right. I didn't I didn't intend to slander an entire uh, narrative of black excellence 
and black cultural development with the vic I'm saying that 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 is particularly and let's let's face it on the left particularly on the left a victimhood narrative that is predominating okay not exclusively there so that's what I was talking about but you're right you don't have to have those things now let me just say this we have been victimized as black Americans Obviously, we went through enslavement and Jim Crow. Yes. The question is, do you maintain a victim identity as your posture in the world, as the basis for your engagement of the world? And I think the three of us would agree, would agree no.